And without any further ado, let's get into the question and answer session. I'm getting an awful lot of questions coming in at the moment. Um, so can I just welcome the panel? For those of you who maybe missed some of the earlier sessions, um, uh, we've got uh, Councillor Andrew Weston, who's the leader of Trafford Council and has been leading the Green um, City Region uh, Group. We've got Marion Spain, who's Chief Executive of Natural England, Sue Longston, who's Director of Operations North for the Environment Agency, and Chris Matthews, Vice Chair of Greater Manchester Natural Capital Group and Head of Sustainability of United Utilities. And I'm Anne Salby, the uh, Chair of the Natural Capital Group. So welcome back. Um, the first question I've got is for Andrew. Um, uh, the pandemic dramatically increased our use of public parks and green spaces and has allowed many of our citizens directly experience how nature can offer a solution to urban challenges. What long lasting impacts on our agenda do you think we're going to see from the pandemic? Thanks Anne. Morning everybody. Um, great to be here and, and a really good question actually. We've seen I think a real shift in the public consciousness in terms of the importance of our parks and green spaces as a result of the pandemic. I think particularly the recognition of the positive impact on mental health and well-being alongside physical health and well-being, that was perhaps always accepted. But I think with people locked up in their homes all day and only allowed out for one hour a day to exercise, we've, we've really seen um, a shift in um, the value which people place on their local environment. I think for me, you know, just as, just as a practical example, I've found green spaces within sort of 20 minutes walk of the place that I've lived all my life that I didn't know existed. Um, and yet, as you're there, you can see the positive biodiversity impacts that are, that are evident from spaces like that. Um, but also just seeing so many people out and about enjoying them. I think one of the things more broadly um, that, that has definitely been clear is the way in which people noticed the improvement in air quality early on in the pandemic as they were walking to and from and, and out and about on those green spaces. And I think that's something that we we really don't want to lose. And, and actually, in the next few days, we'll be publishing the final details of the Greater Manchester Clean Air Plan, which will be the largest clean air zone um, in Europe. So, so I think really the, the huge, huge opportunity that we have here is to take advantage of the shift in public feeling towards parks and green spaces to make sure um, that the case is made for investment of our existing parks and green spaces, but also to see improvements and developments moving forward. So, um, you know, the examples of RHS Bridgewater, the Northern Roots Project and others really, but also even, even on much smaller levels to see green spaces included in new developments, for, for instance. So I, so I think there are huge opportunities really and we have to capture the mood and capture the moment that we've been given um, so that we can build back better and greener from the pandemic. Thanks, Anne. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, moving on to Mariam, um, you mentioned in your speech that local nature recovery strategies need to sit side by side with local plans to help inform spatial decision making. Obviously, we've just developed the Greater Manchester um, uh, local nature recovery strategy. And uh, it really, the question is about what sort of, um, you know, what links will there be between local nature recovery strategies and local plans and how can we drive that? Thank you, Anne, and hello, everybody. Um, as you say, Anne, we've just finished a number of local nature recovery strategy pilots, Greater Manchester being one of them. And I think there's two or three things, important generic lessons coming out of them. I think one of the important lessons is the need for these to not just be a data gathering exercise. This is not just a mapping exercise. This is an engagement exercise as well. It's not just mapping the nature we've got, but talking to people about what nature they want and, all, and what nature they can offer, if I can put it that way. So there's something for me about making sure the strategies are very engaging. And there's also something important, I think, as well, coming out, particularly from the Greater Manchester pilot, about how the strategies all fit together and not thinking about them in isolation, thinking about how they cross boundaries and how they join up at the edges, um, particularly important for some of our, um, our protected landscapes, for example, as to how we build those connections between our most beautiful places and our towns and cities. So there's some really important learning coming out of the pilots. But I think as your question hints at, the other really important learning 
is these strategies need to have teeth. There is no point having them done as a nice to have strategy. They now need, we need to start to embed them into decisions made, including decisions made by local government and regulators and funders and so on. And I think that's why the idea of linking them to local plans comes in. It's too soon to say yet exactly what government are going to do about that, about whether it's going to be something that's actually written into the planning reforms and future planning legislation. But I guess my other thought on that is whether or not it actually becomes mandated that they are part of a planning policy framework and a material consideration in planning, for example. There's lots that local authorities can already do under their existing powers to make sure they use their local nature recovery strategies to make decisions on housing, make decisions on design, makes decisions on provision of green space, and also to think about how they're going to target the use of biodiversity net gain money in the future. So whether or not it becomes mandated, I'd ask everybody on the call to have a start to think about how you'll now make your local nature recovery strategy work. Brilliant, thank you. I think the other thing that came very much to the fore while we were doing the Greater Manchester one was very much the capacity in planning authorities to do a lot of the yeah. work as well. So we need to watch that one. Thank you. Um, so moving on to, to Sue, um, <laughs> combined sewer overflows. <laughs> uh, there's been a lot of media interest um, around these recently. And the question is, what's the EA doing to address this? And is there a role for nature based solutions in this process? Okay, thank you for your question. Um, I'll, I'll start with uh, what we're doing about it. Um, obviously, we've worked with uh, DEFRA and the water companies to, to get all the overflows monitored and to make that data widely available uh, so people can see it. So we start to understand the scale of the problem. Uh, we're working locally with, with United Utilities and other water companies elsewhere um, to start to then understand why some of these might be spilling more often than we expect them to. Um, and then to understand, you know, is that a big environmental issue? Where do we start to prioritise our efforts uh, to put, put in place some solutions? And at a national level, we're working with Offwat and DEFRA and others to also look at then what solutions are there and what finance mechanisms could be put in place to, to fund any improvements. So that's kind of like a big scale. In terms of specifics around nature-based solutions, um, it's hard at this stage to say what contribution they could make. And I think some of this, we're going to have to accept that we're going to trial and see how well it goes. But I think that there is a big role for nature-based solutions. There's green infrastructure. Um, so anything that stops water from getting into the systems really would be really helpful. So green infrastructure, such as sustainable urban drainage, which, which I know Chris spoke about in his, his, his talk, um, and also green roofs, that kind of thing. Uh, the slow the flow uh, project. So we do a lot on the environment agency for flood risk management purposes, but anything that slows the flow of water into the system as well would be really helpful. Um, and then just working with planners again, so it's obviously going to be a critical, a critical pinch point in terms of resources, but working with them in the planning process to see what we could do through that route as well. I think just stepping back a little bit in terms of nature-based solutions as well, we, we just spoke earlier, didn't we, about um, people now reconnecting with nature and their environments. And I think that's raised awareness of storm overflows, which is great. But what we need to do is, is capitalise on that and raise awareness of, of the impact that individuals have on, on the storm overflows blocking. So thinking about putting the wrong stuff down the toilet, etc. You know, it's, it's how do we engage people in that as well through nature um, so that we, we stop that problem going forward. I mean, I would just say it is really complicated. I don't think there's any easy solution, but we do have to work together um, to resolve it and to find funding for it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sue. Um, moving on to Chris, a uh, question for yourself. Um, how can regulation better enable greater uptake of nature-based solutions on a wider scale? Big question. <laughs> it is, Anne. Thanks very much and good morning, uh, everybody. Yes, I, I think um, good regulation is what we all want to see. Uh, because good regulation will enable us to deliver the outcomes that we want to see for, for nature in, uh, it has to be in an affordable way. Um, so we need to be creating the regulatory structures to, to achieve that. Um, but sometimes we can see differences between some public statements and, and, and action. So if you take, as a recent example, we submitted to off what uh, plans for a green recovery, and uh, some of those plans will be taken forward and colleagues of mine in some of the other contributions today will be talking about, uh, about that. But off what applied a 10% reduction to nature-based solutions in terms of the cost to deliver, whereas for the grey infrastructure solutions, there was no cost challenge. And so 
what message does that send out from a regulatory point of view about the commitment to nature-based solutions? So really what we need to see, I think, is the right form of regulation that encourages and incentivizes, incentivizes us to do these things. And there's an element of culture underpinning this because we've become very used to delivering specific solutions to a specific output that you can measure the difference, you know, what, what the effluent into the receiving waters is actually doing. And with nature-based solutions, we need a bit more time for those solutions to deliver that same uh, output or, or, or outcome. And the, the mechanisms need to accommodate uh, that. I think also one of the observations we would make as a sector is a couple of decades of you know, multi-billion pound investment means that the contribution from water companies to water quality issues is lessening. Now, I don't want to send out the message that there's nothing left for water companies to do, far from it, but probably we're now equal in terms of contributors to water quality issues as agriculture is, roughly 40% uh, a piece. And I think what we need to do now is, is, is while, while we've seen it's been probably, probably more straightforward to regulate a smaller number of companies, i.e. the water and sewage companies, we need to be looking at how we can do more to regulate agriculture and its contribution to the water quality challenges we face. And I'm not saying that to have a go at agriculture far from it because they play such a vitally important role. But we're going to have to find ways to address their contribution to water quality issues alongside the contribution that water companies themselves make. So I think what I would say there is we need a level playing field in, in regulation to uh, emerge, a strong commitment to nature-based uh, solutions as well, and supporting and incentivizing more partnership working. I think it's a theme we've already heard across this morning already, that the regulatory mechanisms need to support partnership working and partnership outcomes. And if we can get some of those things in place, then hopefully that will be the good regulation that I think we all uh, want to see and can build on the good regulation we already have. Brilliant, thank you. And hopefully the environmental land management system will give us some carrots as well as some sticks to do all that, yeah, particularly in the agriculture sector. Um, right, back to Andrew. Um, today we're celebrating the launch of the University of Salford's Living Lab and last month we saw the launch of RHS Bridgewater and we've got, uh, as you mentioned, Oldham's Northern Roots project uh, coming online. How significant are flagship projects such as these in our efforts to transform Greater Manchester into a green city region? Thanks, Anne. I mean, in short, hugely important, you know, um, but I think, I think for two principal reasons. One is the obvious environmental benefit that they bring in and of themselves. You know, if you think about Northern Roots, we're talking about the largest eco park in Europe, 160 acres. Um, so massive um, potential there for, for biodiversity net gain and the positive benefits that they bring to um, the communities that, that, they're, that they're set in to, to look at them in isolation. But actually, more importantly for me, is the positive impact that they bring to again, that public debate, that understanding of the importance of, of green spaces and that showcasing of the benefits of them. So if you think about RHS Bridgewater, for example, you know, 152 acres, I want to say, off the top of my head, again, a huge, huge space revived um, as a community garden, basically. And, and what's really impressive there, when you think about them as flagships and, and the benefits therein, is the way that they've involved the community. Um, so yes, community gardening, Yes, green social prescribing, which I think is um, really, really a huge opportunity for us. I'm pleased that we've got half a million um, within GM to look at pilots for that. But in particular with RHS Bridgewater, um, the learning garden there and the fact that they're looking to bring um, 7,000 school children through there each year, learning about the benefits of green spaces and the positive impact that that can have on our environment. So as assets in and of themselves, hugely important but as um, showcases really for what we're looking to do in Greater Manchester and as places that attract people and can show those positives, I think even more important um, than just as the, the physical entities that they are. Yeah, thank you, thanks very much. Um, I also think I was very worried we were going to sort of lose the plot on green social prescribing, but I'm really heartened that we're still hanging on to that despite the pandemic, so that's great. Um, moving on then, uh, Marion again, um, you talked about the importance of peak restoration in the Greater Manchester context. Obviously, it's a big thing for us in Greater Manchester. How do we ensure that peat and more specifically lowland peat is restored to function ecosystems and avoids being subject to carbon emitting land pressures? 
Um, it's a topical one, isn't it, Anne? Um, I'm sure some of you will have seen, if, if nothing else, at least the headlines from the Committee for Climate Change report this week on the, the more progress needed on adaption to climate change as well as mitigation. And one of the things that leapt out at me in that report is, of course, the two can work against each other. And Peter's is exactly an example of where that is happening. That as temperatures rise and as we have shifting rainfall patterns, it is even more at risk. Our peat is even more at risk of drying out and degrading and therefore emitting carbon rather than playing the job we all want to do of capturing carbon. So yet another sort of clarion call for why we do need to be really focusing on getting our peat restored. Um, I think in terms of how we ensure it, we know how to do it. We know technically how to do it. We've got lots of examples, including in the greater Manchester area, of doing it successfully. We also now have access to new sources of funding. We have the government's new um, Peatland Grant Scheme that Natural England is administering. So um, get in touch if you haven't already or look on the website if you've got ideas for a big peat restoration problem. So I think we, it's important we do it. I think, again, that there's a link here to the, some of the other conversations we've had today. We have the know-how, we have the money, but we also need to have our communities and our decision makers engaged in making it happen. So we need, there are going to be some really difficult choices about land use, aren't there, about where we have tree planting, where we have development. But I think given the evidence we have saying that peat is our most important carbon store, in many circumstances, it's more important than woodlands, certainly more important than newly planted woodlands. This feels to me like the time for those of us working together in regions and in areas to be really thinking about where are the opportunities for further peat restoration. Brilliant, thanks, yes. I'm still one of those people who still walks into garden centres and demands to know where the peat free compost is and causes a bit of a scene if there isn't any. But I mean, we can all do our bits, yeah. can't we? <laughs> uh, right, thanks for that. Um, uh, Sue, um, you talked about water quality and you said that only 3% of the water bodies in the Greater Manchester City region are good ecological status. And the question is, what are you going to do about this? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, we, well, we're doing as much as we can with the resources that we've got. It's probably the first thing that I would say. Um, we do a lot through regulation, um, as you've already heard, regulation of the water companies and, and through their asset investment programme. But we do regulate other sectors, including agriculture, um, which Chris mentioned just now. Um, but in terms of more nature-based approaches, uh, we invest quite a bit in natural capital through our flood and coastal risk management um, projects and programmes. Uh, we have an environmental programme which we uh, deliver in partnership with many, many partners um, in, in the Manchester, Manchester area. Um, and we also invest money from rod license income to improve fish passage. And I think that's the thing I'd, I'd really like to bring out here is that water quality is made up of so many different elements. While well, 3% doesn't sound like a lot, Actually, it, you know, it's not as bad as it sounds, but it clearly isn't as good as we'd like it to be either. You know, what we've got here is, um, a, 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 you know, an urban area. We've got a big industrial heritage, lots of physical modification. So, you know, we have to really think carefully about the work we can do to create space for nature. And again, that comes at a cost. So it can be a bit slow. But we've got good practice elsewhere in the country where we've opened up big industrial rivers to salmon, for example. So there's no reason why we can't do it here as well if we work together. Yeah. And those of us who've been around quite a long time in, in <laughs> the area and in the business know that, you know, we had a huge Mersey Basin campaign to really, really push this whole agenda forward. And, uh, you know, we, we really cleared up a lot of rivers and moved a long way forward. I'm not saying we should be complacent, but, you know, we have come a long way, haven't we? We have. Yeah. OK, um, Chris, another one for, for yourself. Um, what additional monitoring could be implemented within catchments to better understand catchment challenges and opportunities? And how could this also help assess the effectiveness of nature at catchment scale? Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Anne. I just would say to, to Marianne that so when it comes to peatland restoration at United Utilities, we had committed to restore 1,000 hectares of peat by 2030, but our recent green recovery submission would allow us to increase that by 50% to 1,500 uh, hectares. So we're very much on the, uh, the mission to restore peatland, uh, as uh, I'm sure you're uh, aware. Um, when it comes to uh, monitoring, uh, it's critically important, as I build from the answer I gave before, if we're to make that convincing case that we need to invest more 
and people want to see the guaranteed outcome, we've got to monitor. And I think monitoring is proving to be tough because perhaps in the business case for doing these things, it's monitoring, which is almost the afterthought. Um, we've been trying to do that. We have been doing that. But monitoring and catchments has been scaled back a little bit. Uh, COVID's not um, helped that, of course. And the opportunity does exist really for us to do much more in monitoring. But I don't think it always has to come through formal organisations like ourselves or the Environment Agency. We've seen people connecting with nature. And I think we've got to embrace the power of citizen science here and actually have confidence that actually people in the community can gather data that we can use, that we can have confidence in. Uh, and then that can either demonstrate improvements have been made or feed into the, uh, the case for, for, for funding. And we're going to be looking to try and secure some funding to do more of that sort of activity in, in the coming uh, months and, and years. Because if we get quality data, we can have confidence in our, in our solutions. Uh, it takes time, though. I mean, we've seen with our SCA, uh, Sustainable Catch Management Programme, SCAMP, which we started in 2005, that we very much believed that we would see improvements in raw water quality helping to drive down treatment costs. 15, 16 years in, we're seeing that raw water quality improvement slowly emerging, um, but it's not yet translating into what you would say is a significant reduction in treatment costs, but I'm actually convinced that will, that will come. So what we've got to accept is that when we get the data, it still might be time before we see the positive outcome. Um, but what we have to do, I think, as a community of uh, organisations wanting to see improvements is actually look at how perhaps we can come together to embrace the science that can be provided from, by others, accept it for what it is and work with it and if, embed it into our decision making processes. We look to have lost our host. I was just about to say the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> and that wasn't me volunteering to step in because I haven't got the list of questions. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I think that's just, uh, while, while, while there is a gap, I would just, I think the points you were just making there, Chris and, and Sue, I think that opportunity now we have to be thinking about how we join these things together and thinking about the fact that water quality is a vehicle to better nature, better communities for people to live in, as well as the climate change solution. I think that's going to be a big theme for all of us over the next um, six to 12 months, really thinking about how we understand how to tackle pollution issues. You know, your point, Chris, it's not just, it's not just water quality issues, it's a farming issue. And I think that's certainly a theme I'm hearing more and more, that sense that people are now ready to start making those changes mm -hmm. and are asking those of us in government and regulators to make those changes. And um, we were just filling in while we lost you. <laughs> uh, my screen froze. <laughs> reconnect. Apologies for that. Um, right. There was a sort of supplementary question, um, I think, that really leads on from what uh, Chris was just saying. It's really complementing the work that you've done at uh, with RSPB at Dovestone as a fantastic example of moorland restoration. I think I've lost Anne's question. Yes, I'm, I'm seeing fellow panelists nod. So uh, nice to hear the compliment, but I, I can't hear the question. So I don't know whether, um, Krista, you have access to the question and can share it or whether we need to wait for Anne to return. I wonder if as we don't have the question, I'd be interested to hear a little bit more from Andrew um, from that sort of very local perspective about some of those comments you're making about people valuing green space and what more we can do, you know, what are our opportunities as we think about the green recovery to, um, to really promote that and really have that built into, into local government plans. So, hi Chris, um, yeah, I've, um, I don't know what's happened here, but I'm, what I will do is I will um, feed in the questions I've sent to Anne over to you if you're able to pick up Chris. Sorry, I suspect we're hearing something that, that those listening aren't actually. Sorry, that threw me, threw me a little bit. Um, I think the first thing is, is an awareness of um, upcoming local plans. There are a number of, of local authorities, including my own, actually, who are 
um, revising local plans at present. And they they are, in my view, the, you know, the best possible opportunity that we have to enshrine our expectations. So mm. certainly if there are um, things that people want to see in there, feed into consultation processes, feed into um, local councillors, the sort, the sort of things that people would like to see. There's no doubt in my mind that there is more of an appetite, not just for um, using our green spaces and recognising their value in a, in a different way, but also um, stepping outside of, of that, looking at the redistribution of um, space more broadly. So if you think about active travel, sustainable journeys, et cetera, et cetera, you know, across the piece, stepping outside of natural capital, um, I think now is the time for a big conversation about all of these things and just making sure that we um, we take that opportunity, really. It is incredibly um, difficult. These conversations are always sensitive because at the same time that we are declaring climate and biodiversity emergencies, we're also receiving housing figures from government, for instance. So there's an inherent tension there and there always will be. Um, but I definitely think as, the, as that shift in public mood has been seen, we shouldn't lose sight of it. And we should move quickly to try and, and take advantage of it um, whilst the mood is with us, really. Easy to say, very difficult to do in practice, I think. But the local plan would be um, the best way to, to make sure that that is there for the next 10 or 20 years, really. Andrew, I've got another question for you that sort of links to that. It's the Descupta review emphasises that investing in nature now will save money in the future. And it's how significant do you think invest to save argument would be to generate increased money for nature-based solutions in the city region. And I suppose that relates also to the fact that, you know, we're under huge pressures in, for local authority funding, but how do we get that, you know, if you invest now and you save in the future, but it's jam today, jam tomorrow sort of argument, isn't it? It's, it's, re it's really frustrating, actually. So if there was one thing that I could change, you know, obviously I'd always ask for more money, but one of the things that I would like to best understand is the pipeline of investment that might be available. Um, and when I look at the way that councils are funded, it's always a one year settlement. Um, a really good example, not on the natural capital side, but within the green agenda is retrofit funding. So we've received monies to retrofit the public estate in Greater Manchester, um, but we got it confirmed at fairly short notice and have to spend the money um, you know, by the end of the year. And so from a from a broader opportunities perspective, you're really limited in what you can do. And there are huge opportunities there to be upskilling and reskilling people, for instance. But because everything's at breakneck speed and you've not got that line of sight on investment that may be available, um, there there is a huge challenge. But what we, you know, what we do do fairly well in GM, I think, is is, you know, the partnership working that we have. Um, both with the public and, and third sector, but also with business. Um, and increasingly through things like the GM Environment Fund, we're seeing um, a recognition that we do need to, to make the investment now to safeguard ourselves for the future, really. So that fund has brought in £2 million in six months from businesses who want to do the right thing, actually, and have perhaps been offsetting elsewhere um, you know, their, their environmental obligations for some time. Um, but are now looking at ways that they can do that locally to have the most impact on the area where they operate. And I think that's a really, really good example of something positive that's come out um, on the fund funding front. So it's about making sure that the limited resources that we have are spent within GM, first and foremost, but also on schemes that have um, the most environmental impact and, and offer the best nature-based solutions. And actually, the work of the Living Lab will really help to contribute towards that and the data and the evidence that comes forward from that I think gives us a really good opportunity to make sure that that investment's going in the right places. Lovely. Thanks very much. I've got another question coming from Marion. Uh, what more can we be all doing to make sure that the biodiversity net gain principles and mandatory requirements can be applied to all developments including all large and nationally significant infrastructure projects not just local planning authority jurisdiction projects? <laughs> I have good news on that, Anne. Um, the government just this Monday have committed to tabling an amendment in the Environment Bill to extend biodiversity net gain to NSIP, so to road, rail and so on. Um, and you might also have seen um, that Department of Transport have also committed that uh, the HS2 will have biodiversity net gain, at least for its latter stretches, the stretches coming up towards Manchester, but also looking at what more they can do on the existing stretches. Um, 
I always feel slightly worried when I start getting excited about biodiversity net gain because, of course, it is not a substitute for mitigation. It is it is the ultimate. It is the it is the further additional test once we have done everything to prevent damage. And I think certainly in the context of HS2 and many other big road and rail and infrastructure developments, there's still a job to be done to make sure that um, protected sites are protected, that woodlands are protected, that tunneling solutions and so on are used again. But I certainly believe that once we have done everything we can to avoid damage, the very next best thing is, is making nature better. And I guess that's the theme of a part of the theme of today's com conference, isn't it? That we are now in a time when we are able to talk and feel confident that we can make nature better, not just conserve it. So biodiversity, again, any form of development is a way, an opportunity to make nature better. So hopefully um, heading in the right direction. And just to sort of complete that picture, also live discussions about how we might apply biodiversity net going to offshore wind developments as well. So we could beginning to think about a solution to reconciling the need for more infrastructure for green energy, but also a way to protect and enhance our marine environment. So hopefully that's good news to whoever that's raised the question. Right. I haven't heard that, it's fantastic. Um, moving on to Sue again, um, Greater Manchester Combined Authority and Partners have done excellent work in progressing natural capital and biodiversity net gain approach across the city uh, as part of as a result of the pilot projects like the DEFRA Pioneer and the Local Nature Recovery Pilots. How do you think these approaches can be progressed in areas that don't have the benefits of pilots like this and that where we haven't got perhaps an authority that is showing such leadership and is progressive so i suppose how do we do we get this out to the rest of the world <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly and, and we need to we definitely need to and i think we also need to to learn a bit more about what else is happening out, outside in the world too um so i think really the, the onus is on all of us isn't it, as individual stakeholders and partners to be promoting the great work that's done here what it's achieving and delivering you know and really spreading the word about what what it could offer uh, both nationally but but internationally as well um, and I know you've, you've got the, the session later on about the living lab where I think you've got real potential there to, to be leading the way um, and influencing um, internationally I reckon on that one. Yeah I think there's one that's here for you Sue and for Chris really um, river water quality much more enforcement is needed as water quality pollution seems to be getting worse and will this be realistically addressed e.g the Irwell at Drinkwater Park is full of plastic often full of sediment and tributaries suffer from regular sewage discharge <laughs> okay um, do you want me to start yeah so um Again, it's, it's similar to the question on water quality more generally. We, we do as much as we can with the resources we, we've got. Um, and our enforcement activity actually is funded by grant in aid, which has been reduced quite significantly. So we're in a situation where we're really prioritising our, our effort and then collecting information and evidence um, about cro more chronic but, but lower levels of pollution so that we can target action. Um, so we probably don't do as much as people want us to do, um, but we're really committed with the money we've got to do as much as we possibly can. Um, and, and to do campaigns and to raise awareness. And uh, now with a water company, it's much more straightforward and I'm sure Chris will come in, but, but I think it's much more straightforward for us to regulate the water companies. It's where it's other, other sources, more diffuse sources of pollution that, that we, you know, we really, really have to put more effort. And Dan, if I can add to what uh, Sue said there, yes, from a, a water company point of view, we can invest in improving the discharges into the water environment, improving the monitoring, of combined sewer overflows, which we've done at £1.2 billion since 2000 into sewer overflows. So we are doing our bit. There's more to be done, no doubt about it. But it isn't just a case of every overflow is let's spills, let's do something about it. Let's actually understand the impact of the overflow and prioritise the investment because actually we can't invest in every single one. And the more data we can get, the better our informed our investment priorities will be. But Sue makes a really, really important point that even if the water industry deals with its issues, that's not going to eliminate the issues in the rivers. And everybody, every organisation needs to play, play its part. So every time somebody flushes a wipe down the toilet, that's contributing to the problem. So we need to get those behavioural campaigns out there and people to change their behaviour, not see their toilets as a bin. Every time a developer doing an extension at a house misconnects the, the foul pipe into the surface water drains, 
that's contributing to the problem and we need to eliminate that and so on and so forth. So again, this isn't about pointing a finger at any particular one organisation or sector. What this is saying is everybody can play a part to improving river water quality. What we need to do is find the efficient solutions that will get us there because what we don't want to do is incur unnecessary costs. I mean, Councillor Weston made the point about more money. He's absolutely right. But at the same time, I think if we came together and we were more effective with our collaborations, we might spend a little bit less because actually if everyone chips in, we're not duplicating and overlapping. We're actually being much more efficient. And if people think the word partnership is tired and cliched, it isn't. It is the solution to these problems. And can I just pick up on, on plastics as well? Yeah. Um, so so we, we're funding research nationally um, to better understand the different sources of, of plastics and actually what environmental harm plastics do in the environment. Uh, we're working with water companies to, to look at, you know, what, what plastics are coming out uh, through their processes and how they could be reduced. But we're also targeting, you know, highways to look at what, what's coming in off roads and, you know, and, and drainage that way. Um, and we're working with the plastics industry more, more generally around their emissions and how they can be reduced too. So there's, we're re really active. There's a lot happening on plastics, um, just so, so that you're aware of that too. Yeah, thank you. Um, another one coming for, for Marion. Um, Prior to tree planting, are there appropriate ecological surveys undertaken to ensure habitats of existing conservation value are not lost? Often vacant areas of land already have a higher value as they are not farmed. And if areas of farmland, e.g. heavily grazed pasture that are most in need of restoration, how much is natural regeneration being considered and where there is an existing seed source? So it's a few questions there really. Mm. <laughs> I think there are two or three questions in there, and so I'll, I'll try and address them all briefly and quickly. So I think it is the old right tree, right place cliche, isn't it? And, and judging right tree, right place does need to start with a what have we got there already? You know, is the, is the habitat we've got already, um, what is the value of that? And I guess that often feels a particularly um, difficult judgment in, in the point we were talking about earlier about peat you know and there's certainly a very active dialogue between natural england and forestry commission and a number of other landowners about what is our approach on, on planting on existing peat on planting on degraded peat you would probably guess from what i said earlier that natural england's view is, is peat trumps trees when it comes to carbon but of course it's not a black and white conversation um so there's certainly something about that there are rules in place there are regulatory solutions such as the need for environmental impact assessments before tree planting so they that should capture the other the damage um i think the um i just forgotten the latter part of the question there was something in there as well about um right trees wasn't there yeah so just let me get that back up again um yeah it was about vacant areas often have higher conservation value and also talking about natural regeneration those yes. are the other two parts uh, for natural re regeneration, I will refer you all. God, am I allowed to advertise a newspaper at an event like this? I refer you to the article written by Patrick Gar Barkham in today's Guardian, um, which um, talks about the experience at Monk's Wood and, and a long term natural regeneration. So, natural regeneration is written into the government tree policy as a legitimate means of creating woodland. And I think the article on Monk's Wood gives a really good example of how it can happen. Thanks very much. Um, Andrew, again, um, there's a question about ecotourism and uh, its role in green recovery. I think it's coming from some of the very good birding groups that we've got in uh, in Greater Manchester, sort of talking about the perfect 10 birds of Greater Manchester and, and trying to encourage people to fill in the survey monkey for that. But yeah, the role of ecotourism. <clears throat> um. It's an interesting one. I was re I was reading about people flocking to a Scottish island recently because an Egyptian vulture had been um, spotted there. Actually, but there is um, there is a huge, I think, interest in anything um, that encourages people to um, participate in greening schemes, in raising awareness, in helping people to understand what is going on, you know, with our environment. So, you know, the, if you think about the proposal for the Birding City region and having the bird for each um, of the local authorities, that is something that will help to raise awareness, that is something that will help to pique interest, that is something that we can talk to children about, um, you know, in our schools. So anything that helps with education, be that to drive ecotourism, be that to drive um, general awareness in the populace, 
uh, can only be a positive thing for me. And I think that the more that we look to take, you know, the opportunities of that, I'd love to know, um, you know, the number of visitors, for instance, that Bridgewater will see in its first in its first year. Um, so I think that there are, there are massive opportunities for us as a city region to take advantage of that. And it's something that, that certainly, I mean, I'm, I'm leaving um, the Green City region portfolio. In fact, I've already left it um, with the exception of, of delivery of the clean air plan. But I certainly think that that's something that um, Councillor Neil Emmett, the, the new leader of Rochdale, would be interested in, in talking about how we might develop that. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Um... Oh, oh, good one just coming for Marin here. Should Greater Manchester have an agricultural plan? It should have a land use plan. It should have, it's it because this is a lot of what we've talked about today, isn't it? Is about making choices about what we most want from our land. And that applies equally in, in urban, peri-urban and uh, rural situations and actually links across the two. So I think my off the cuff comment is we should certainly be thinking about um, what are the different things we want from our land. We talked a moment ago about using the local nature recovery strategy, perhaps as a framework for that. But I think there is also a, a conversation that perhaps as part of the Greater Manchester strategy, perhaps we should be starting a conversation that says also, what do we want from agricultural land? Um, and as we're moving through the agricultural transition and paying public for money for public goods, there's some very live conversations that individual farmers will need to be thinking about, about do they want to carry on producing principally food and fibre, or are they also interested in adding nature and carbon solutions as part of their farming mix? And I think that's something that's legitimate for more of the community to be having that conversation, as well as individual farmers. You know, there's more funding opportunities, aren't there? Chris was talking about SCAMP, you know, the water companies are looking at investing in working with private landowners. So, yes, um, I think probably yes. And I think let's start to think about what we want to use our land from and what we want to ask of and buy of our landowners and land managers. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah, I mean, the local nature recovery strategy pilot in, in GM was particularly focusing on the urban fringe area, really, because it, 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 it sometimes has different dynamics than the straight rural areas and people own land and use land in, in very different ways and have very different perceptions of it. So it would be very interesting to see how that would pan out in a, in a peri-urban area as well. Yeah, no, that's, that's good, thank you. Um, right, um, oh, back to uh, Andrew. I mean, these are very much about um, housing and investment in Greater Manchester. So the government has put forward the green agenda at the forefront of its policies. But how will this affect future house building plans? And how do we really mobilise businesses into nature based solutions? Sorry, there's two questions there, really. Yeah. So so I think if I take the second, the second part first, it is about giving them opportunities to see um, the impact they can have, you know, an awful lot of businesses from very small, ethically minded businesses to large corporations understand now that they they need to be doing all that they can to offset their carbon impact or indeed, um, you know, beyond that to make a positive contribution to their communities. That's why something like the GM Environment Fund, which I mentioned earlier, is really important because I think that there is an increasing clamour really to make those interventions locally. Um, and so by having that pot of funding, and like I say, that's already brought in £2 million in six months, we can give businesses the opportunity to have the most impact in the area most local to them. And I think through that, that's how you can um, sort of change the discourse around the, the positive contribution that business can make to, to helping to, to tackle the climate and biodiversity crisis. Just on, on house building, I mean, look, this is this is a real challenge. You know, this, this is something that, that we we grapple with um, as a city region, really, you will all be aware of the history of what was once known as the Greater Manchester Spatial Framework that is now known as, as Places for Everyone. And there's no doubt that um, any major development proposal such as that is going to have um, a significant impact on our natural environment. It involves in Greater Manchester um, significant building on Greenbelt, including in my own borough in Trafford. And yes, I can say that I've reduced the number of homes planned for the Greenbelt in Trafford um, by nearly half, but it doesn't actually take away from the fact that we still have a housing crisis. 
Um, and some people will say that we that we don't, but I'm firmly of the view that we do have um, a housing crisis. As somebody who is struggling to spend three hundred thousand pounds on a home in Trafford at the moment, um, you know the the way that the property market has been um, artificially propped up through policy choices over the past twelve months um, has exacerbated that problem. But there is no doubt in my mind that regardless of that, we need homes. Um, it is about. Um, and, and, you know, we, we heard this earlier, it is about where um, government policy, as it currently does, requires us to, um, you know, provide a five year supply of land and where we feel that that house building is required, um, that we make those positive interventions as best we can, you know, because we were talking about something like HS2 will always have um, a detrimental impact on the environment, but it's about making sure um, through the planning process, through um, discussions with developers that there is um, mitigation in place as best as possible. You know, it would be wrong of me to to say that, that the Places for Everyone scheme is perfect. It certainly isn't, but I do believe that it needs to happen. Um, and so it is about the conversations that you have about making sure that those particularly new communities on Greenbelt land are well connected, have good public um, transport links, have local amenities to, um, you know, reduce the impact that those new communities will have on the environment, but also positive schemes such as tree planting and various other um, measures that you can put in place as part of that. It's never going to um, reverse any damage done from development. We know that. Um, but these, you know, if I if I existed in a world where um, we didn't have to meet those targets, we'd be having a different conversation. But unfortunately. Um, you know, it's, it is conflicting pressures and it's about mitigation as best we can, um, I'm afraid, really. Yes, it must be terrible sitting there with those conflicting domes and trying to sort of reconcile them. I really have had a lot of sympathy for that whole process, actually, as an escaped town planner myself. <laughs> uh, right, I think I'm going to have to draw the uh, question time to a close. Um, because we are sort of running slightly over. Um, can I just say thank you to all the panellists for their very well thought through responses to many questions. Thanks to the people who sent all the questions in. You certainly kept us on our toes. Um, and um, I just would like to say that, I mean, that's for me, that was fantastic contribution and learning and, and looking at the passion of everybody on the panel uh, to, to making this go forward. It just gives me great heart. So uh, thank you very much to, to everybody for that. Um, I think we're just moving on to closing remarks now. Um, uh, so I would just like to, to wrap up really for the morning. I know we've got an afternoon session and I don't want to eat too much into your lunch break. Um, so sort of reflecting on what's happened this morning, I, I mean, I too have spent, well, probably 40 years of, of my career working in the environment sector. And um, it's a bit like sort of Marion was saying, you know, at the start, environment was a bit of a nice to do, an add on, wasn't, wasn't really seen connected to the economy or health and well-being. Uh, certainly wasn't connected to the survival of the, the planet. Um, and I suppose us conservationists were probably seen as strange tree huggers or definitely a drag anchor on the um, economic development. <laughs> um, and it's taken us an awful long time really, hasn't it, to wake up to the true value of, of nature. Uh, strangely, it has taken global warming, devastation of our insect, plant and bird life and the pandemic just to really understand um, how dependent we really are on a healthy natural environment and how connected we are to that for, for, our, for our, you know, our well-being. So we do stand at a really pivotal point, at a, at a cusp really, where we have to commit to the future sort of green agenda or collectively sort of go back to sleep because it's too hard, there's not enough resource, whatever. I don't think that's the attitude in Greater Manchester at all. The attitude in Greater Manchester is we're going to do this. <laughs> and Nature Based Solutions is really helping to reframe these issues into win win scenarios. You know, if you've got a business that wants to offset its carbon, who then can give us the money to restore the peat bogs, you know, they tick their box, we tick our box, you know, everybody's, everybody's happy. 
And as Councillor Weston said, you know, we've set up the new fund really to try and say we're open for that sort of business and we're going to drive that sort of business in Greater Manchester. And we're really open to conversations with people about how we use all these new opportunities, the offsetting, the, the net gain, the elms, you know, just if we can corral all those new opportunities together, we can keep driving this agenda. I think we can find some some win wins. And devolution certainly allows us a bit more flexibility. And I'd just like to praise Salford for, for really having a really good stance on no damage to, to the peatlands. So well done. <laughs> Standing up for peat. Sorry, I'm a bit of a, a peat freak, really. Um, and yeah, keep on making nuisances yourself in garden centres if you can, because it will get people to change their behaviour. So I just really think that we are moving forwards on a front foot here. Um, I know it's strange coming out of a pandemic and, and all the challenges we've all faced, but I, I think we have got ourselves in a really good position to, to, to move on this. And before I completely wrap up, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for attending and their contributions. And I really do apologize for the technical difficulties and hopefully uh, people can maybe catch up at the end of this afternoon or on, on the website later. Can I say thank you to all the speakers, fantastic presentations and great contributions to the question session. Can I ask everyone to complete the feedback forms? These are a requirement of our funding for the event and it's one of the ways we get money and it's funded this event. So please, 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 uh, could you uh, fill them in? So do stay tuned for this afternoon for the Living Lab launch. And if you have managed to get a place for tomorrow for the natural course uh, shared water forum. Um, just a few flag ups for the future. Um, the next Mayor's Green Summit is planned to take place in autumn um, and uh, details will be confirmed and shared around the uh, various newsletters, uh, particularly the, the Greater Manchester Green City newsletter. So if you're interested in that, maybe sign up so you'll get notification of that. Obviously, people have already mentioned we've got some big conferences coming up, not least of which is COP26 in November, which is a critical date for putting UK on the map to deliver our climate and biodiversity commitments. And I know Greater Manchester is probably going to be participating in that. So uh, more power to our elbow there. Um, so once again, thank you ever so much, everyone, for, for participating in every way. And uh, I look forward to seeing you this afternoon. Thank you. Bye.